I am here at the Lone Star Museum in Houston for a once in a lifetime behind the scenes experience in this museum and we're gonna take you with me. This is amazing. We built this uh, facility here, 130,000 square feet, two hangars, but it added an amazing education portion to it. We are also the official home of the Texas Hall of Fame, the Texas Aviation Hall of Fame, I'll say. Oh, very cool. And, and we'll walk through that as well. Yeah, and um, now how many of the airplanes do we see here actually fly? Everything that you see flew in, right. with the exception of the PHI helicopter yeah. and the honeybee back behind the PHI. Let's start with the Flying Tiger here. This okay. is an aircraft. It's on loan to us by a gentleman named Bruce Bohannon. Has a little grass strip south of here in Angleton in Hold this on. aircraft. He's got, okay, so time These are to time climb. to climb. Because that's, I've, I've been building my Lance Air with a race oh. and trying to climb it from 1,000 to 10,000 feet yeah. and how fast. And mine's at about six and a half minutes to go to okay, 10,000 10, feet. 10,000 feet, which uh, is going to be right meters, here. So you gotta, Two minutes and 20 seconds? Yeah, but that's in meters, so yeah, I, we got to so, do some but math. Multi, that's about 9,000 feet. Yeah, roughly. So if I'm reading this right, the fastest climbing piston engine aircraft in the world and he went to 20 30 and even 40,000 feet 20 and minutes 24 seconds to 40. <laughs> that's insane <laughs> that is like jet fast yep you're not allowed to do this by the way when normal people come but uh jerry yeah. and, and the people here were like hey jimmy let's 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 treat your audience very special today and he mentioned something about like a space something that we'll get to see behind the scenes that nobody gets to. So this is an SR-71 moment. <laughs> Holy moly. It looks more or less like your normal, your normal cockpit. I read that he would wear an electric motorcycle heated suit. Because he gets so cold up at altitude. That's right. And he breathes oxygen in advance. One very special one that is a good friend of Bruce's, uh, is actually not listed there, but helped him with design knowledge. It's an astronaut, a guy named Hoot Gibson. He's an engineer by training, as well as being an astronaut and a naval aviator, and so he, and a Reno racer, and a lot of things. Now, what I love about this, this is my nerd moment, Continental Motors, a yep. uh, sticker on here, but it's powered by a Lycoming. Just saying, <laughs> just saying. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Lycoming guy myself, just throwing that out there. Even though, you know, Continental, if you want to throw some motors at the 310, I would gladly throw and stickers and basically anything else you wanted to do. That is too stinking neat. That's, that's, so, that's pretty neat. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. This that's is cool. our Corsair, Chance Vod Corsair. Now, we're also very pleased to work with the Lewis Foundation to display some of their aircraft, and we have their Corsair next to it. And oh, this is a Goodyear Corsair. What is it, that? What's the it, difference? Manufactured by Goodyear Corporation, gotcha. as opposed to Chance Vought. Slight differences, but not a lot to it. Our Corsair was actually towards the end of the war, and theirs was a little more in the middle of the war. Ours actually flew, uh, as I said, was manufactured right towards the end of the war, and then went to, flew in Korea, and then went to South America as a fighter for them. It's a night fighter, and one of the things that I'll point night out... Night as in not in the day, but at night? Correct. That's correct. Okay, interesting. You can see the little fin. There's one on both sides. And that blocks that beautiful blue flame that comes out of the exhaust, which destroys the pilot's night vision. Oh, interesting. So it, um, so that little bump right there on the, few, on the engine cowling just behind the exhaust there is there just to block the light from the exhaust Correct. so it doesn't blind the pilot. Correct. And Interesting. Because uh, that can, you know, any white lights or anything, that's why you see in the cockpit, you know, red lights or green lights that won't destroy your night vision. Uh, but beautiful flame that comes out of that and that protects their, their vision from it. Clearly, uh, uh, it's, yes. it's still very <laughs> operational, or it could be. Yes, with correct. With a little bit of maintenance. One of the things that people coming through that are not familiar with them, why are the wings like that? Why, <laughs> why are, are they, they broken? Why are they bent? You know, it's not a hard landing. Uh, oh, you mean from the fuselage? Yeah, yes, exactly, the gold right. wings. And yeah. So we explained to them that this big propeller here, if it were a straight yes. wing, would be into the concrete as the tail comes up, you know, ta-ta-ta-ta, and you can't have that. So instead of having 
the landing gear be so long and make it unstable, have the landing gear normal, and then bring the wing down. So the contact point for the landing gear, the mains, is the lowest point on the wing right there. And the gear goes back like this versus Correct. a lot of the other ones that fold it in. Correct. And, Interesting. Uh, I'm a big fan of low-tech solutions to high-tech problems. That's right. And now, when was the last time this one was flown, do you know? It's been a couple years, I think, since we flew it. We actually flew it to an event, uh, so it flew quite a long distance up Midwest somewhere, North Midwest. We just haven't maintained it in annual. I mean, but we run it periodically. It needs an annual and gas and go. Add a pilot and go. That's right, that's right. And we, we need to talk one of these museums into letting us do a will it start on one of their, you know, cool airplanes like like this one. That would be pretty cool. Oh let hey me, Jerry. <laughs> we'll we'll talk me, later on. Let me like show that. you the contrast. This is the Lewis Legends Corsair. And this one won best World War II fighter at the 2022 Oshkosh. Oh, so, wow. So it clearly has flown fairly recently. Yes. 2022. It came from Oshkosh here to us in Houston here at Lone Star Flight Museum in Ellington. Well, yeah. Uh, it, so, I mean, this is new. This, this is actually a 20-year restoration. I can and see. And look at the amazing condition that this is in. Okay. This is kind of dumb, but just this, the threads where it's epoxied and painted, but the threads are not, they were taped. Like that level of detail Correct. is mentally insane. That's Correct. why it takes 20 years. And with the guns, this is where the shells would come out from the bottom. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. Oh, that's pretty cool. Now, basically the same here, obviously, but let me show you in the front as well that two different types of guns on here. We've got guns that protrude oh, on ours. Oh, two on that one. And then these are embedded in, in the wing. There's an opening there that open to put more bullets in there for the guns. One of the things that I have seen pictures and, and others that would do, they would actually cover these uh, gun exits, if, if you will, where the bullets come out with tape. Mm -hmm. So when they would come back from a mission, the armorers would look and say, is the tape broken? Oh. If the tape is not broken, they don't need to rearm. And it was a quick way to have to check to see if they fired their guns or not. That's it. Yeah, that's so, a super great Again, low-tech solutions to high-tech problems. That's right. And a bullet will go through tape. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, but beautiful aircraft. We're pleased to be able to display it. Wow. So now this one you said was earlier in like in the middle of the war, built Correct. by Goodyear. Correct. That one was the later At one. At the end of it, yes. Yeah. So had, did any of these see, you said that one saw action in like South America or and, South and, or Yes, Africa. and Korea. And Afri Cor South America. Yeah. South America. It's actually fairly rare that you find an aircraft that did see combat. They do exist. But most of them were war-weary, were abandoned in place, were whatever it might be. And so the ones that we often have in the States were trainers mm -hmm. and so forth because it just, they were worn out. That's right. You know? yeah, so, a bunch of 18-year-olds, yeah. you know, making hard landings. Exactly. They don't last too long. So you guys have airplanes that you can do rides in. Correct. And it's probably under an educational thing or something like that. Is Living that right? History Flight Exemption, LHFE. Yep. And uh, we actually sell rides in our B-25, two Stearmans. We have a T-41. We have T-6. In fact, tomorrow we've got a, four flights in uh, Stearmans, and, uh, including a VIP. Yeah, so. we're gonna we're gonna go in a, in a steerman. That's gonna be awesome. And then there's this funky little, whatever this is. What is this thing? This is an Anderson Greenwood. What on and earth? Uh, it's an uh, award winner. After the war, World War II, a lot of manufacturers, a lot of people, thought that all these pilots coming back would all want an airplane. So there was a lot of different small aircraft and other craft that were manufactured, including the concept for this. This became a little bit later. My theory, I can't prove this, but my theory is that a lot of those pilots said, no, man, I don't want to do that. They shoot at me. You know, That's so, fair. So they went back to their lives. They went back to whatever their normal life would be, their jobs and so forth. You're here just before Halloween, so some of our aircraft are decorated. Yeah, it's decorated a little bit. <laughs> that way. Yeah. So this is the Anderson Greenwood. It's a small aircraft but quite an interesting one twin boom tail pusher can i sit in it yes and this already is oh good lord how <laughs> i'm not that tall 
I, I used to be six foot, now I'm 5'11 and 7 eighths. But like, that is one of the weirdest. It kind of feels like position. an air coop inside. It doesn't does. It? The sizing. Oh, because I was, yeah, so it's got rudder pedals on that side and a, oh, it's got a brake down here. Look at that. Right. It's become quite popular for uh, kids and others to see. What was this thing called again? Anderson Greenwood, AG14. Greenwood. <clears throat> Is it experimental or is it a certified airplane? I mean, you'd have to think that it was a certified airplane. Yeah, it, I believe it is. <clears throat> we This one, it did fly in, but we don't operate it. And Number built. Five. Five. Yeah, exactly. Five of these bad boys built. This reminds me of the uh, the, the gyros. That yes. Have, that look like the egg on the front. Right. But yeah. Right. Uh, Oshkosh winner at one point and uh it's almost got like an evergreen livery yeah it going does on, yeah. it does have that look to it i want to know who you guys get to polish especially <laughs> like with the dc3 right there because i need to talk to that guy we've got a 310 that we need some help with we actually have a company that we that we work with and they're all over but they're they have a, their main headquarters here is called sparrowhawk and they actually we work with them and they will clean on our aircraft in exchange for training this is a globe swift Okay. And All right. It, it's oh. not not very fast. It's Weird. got it's, it's got the, the slots uh, kind of like a Stinson or some others did. Look at this. And purpose being at slower speeds, you got airflow over your aileron and gave you That's better right. authority down at lower air speeds. That's right. Cost you on the top end. Yeah. But on the lower end, uh, the speed spectrum you get better control over uh, airflow over your ailerons. That's right, that's right. You'll see a lot of the, uh, the stall, which is short takeoff and landing airplanes, they have these slots in front or slats or- Slots. Slots, I think, yeah. And they'll have some that Sl even- Slats actually come, come out. That's- and, and slots have are fixed. There you go. So you'll see them where they'll come out for super slow speed uh, exactly. holding so that the air doesn't separate. And that's what causes a stall when you're angle of attack is higher than the airspeed you know suction and, and physics some, some and other even witchcraft have and vortex generators in addition to that which yeah. actually help lower that a little bit more it's so it creates it's, those micro it's, vortices it's very effective and very effective wow it's equipped really well this yes. one still flies clearly it does. yeah i was gonna Ab say those avionics this thing still Absolutely. flies quite a bit because it's I mean, it's got decent avionics in it, radios, it's still got a checklist over there, so he's ready to go. This is the Douglas SBD Dauntless. We just came from the, again, correct. I love that. <laughs> so you like have no idea how much I love seeing this much horsepower in the trays right now. If it quits dripping, then that means it's out of oil. <laughs> That's right. So, and at that time, when these aircraft were manufactured, the tolerances were not what they were in later years. You have to remember these were designed by slide rule and pencil and paper mm -hmm. so none of this cad or auto generated and things like that so brilliant guys that that designed them back at that time this one was flying you said it this one just needs an annual on it you we said you just brought it back from well we had it at here at the air show in, in houston one of the reasons that we displayed it this way with the the flats op open and we explain to people why they're slotted and why they're colored, which otherwise they're normally closed. So, and, and it, these are not typical flaps like you would see to where they'd come down to slow down for landing. Correct. And they would normally be closed and then would together. The reason they're slotted that way is this is a dive bomber. And so as they're descending, this helps give them, when they open these up, these helps give them stability and they can just kick the rudder a little bit to, uh, in order to do that. So it gives them, slows down a little bit, but gives them some stability and then to release their bomb. They're painted red. My belief is that if you're following the aircraft and you see it's red, you better take some action. Pop your flaps or peel off to the side because they're slowing down. Yeah, the speed brakes are brake lights. Exactly. There you go, there you exactly. go. Exactly. Fabric Part here, metal there. Exactly. This is kind of in a transition time and with aircraft that they often on their control surfaces would use fabric, but the plane itself would be more metalized. Let's My go. understanding is they use this platform or similar airplanes now for photography. True, because in the back it's open and there's nothing to distort, plexiglass or whatever to distort. Yeah. Uh, that so uh, makes a great platform for that and i suppose you could even mount a, a camera on the stand where the gun sits sure and to have that 
stability for a photo platform. That is pretty neat. If you like this car on the other side, we'll climb up and take a look inside of it. All right. The turret area sitting in there. So that'll spin around too. It looks like it would. Yes. Yeah, so the gun is not fixed. It can actually spin like it's on a turret. Correct. Wow. And so that And that's on a turret too, so he can... It can swivel oh, wow. up, down. Yep, exactly. Oh, that is too neat. And you can see the wood rollers right here where the ammunition belt and the cans would be down there. So it would roll up and be able to come on in. And he's got stirrups down there so he can put his feet to give him to brace as, himself. As you can imagine, sitting facing backwards as the pilot is diving oh, or yeah, dodging, yeah. you bounce around back there. So feet and stirrup gives you that stability to be able to, to really position. Wow. Take a look at the front office. Oh yeah, here we go. Yep, coming up, kind of got your stuff. Now, and the bomb sites are- this, this one, we have a do not fly in there because the annual is not completed. Oh, but yeah, that's right, you guys- We're strict about those kinds of things. Controls, landing gear stuff over there, your throttle and all that stuff is here, normal, selective. Was there anything for when they were in a, in a bomb or sights or anything, or is that all just kind of through that right there? Wait, Practice. are these the guns? This thing's yeah. got guns up here. The back end of it, yeah. <laughs> is it 50 cal? 30 back here and... 30? Those look a little bigger. Yeah. It'd be 50 I, cal. Again, Jimmy, these guys were very young and were given a tremendous amount of responsibility at that time, certainly in World War II, to, oh, to yeah. take off from a carrier and carry out these missions and flying these. This is a cutaway of a 50. Oh yeah, there you go. That, that we show just to just to show the mechanism Slide and so forth. Here. That's right. Throw your belt in. You... So this is the bullet tray here. So your belt would come off of this side and it feeds over to this way. This little has a whole lever that comes up and then comes down. And then you have a big charging handle right here. And then cooling, because it got very, very hot on this end. Yep. Ba, 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 ba. One of our newer Whoa. displays is a hot air balloon. And this actually, like, well, that's not airplanes, no, but it's part of aviation history. And so we wanted to show this. And this gentleman, Dr. Bill Bussey, donated to the museum. And this is a record a balloon. He did quite a few records in this. this so this is the actual balloon. It is. Because yeah, is. you can see here where it's burned, been used and correct. Oh, burned. Yeah, I guess that makes sense yep. for the. Yep. And it got very hot. And he tells the stories Whoa. of this one getting really close to the temperature. You're not supposed to exceed uh, on some of his record flights. And so, fascinating guy. And so, so one this of our would challenges. Have been what he would have worn. This up is there? exactly because he gets so cold in there, and then extra fuel that he would. <laughs> you see bottles inside that he would use. We were challenged on how to display it <laughs> because the, the envelope is so large. That is, it goes up and then back down and, and then there's a whole bunch down in there. You're probably only seeing 25% of the balloon there. DC-3 is in continental livery. It's not the current, well, now they're united. They're, they're, it's going back historic colors. This aircraft was actually originally flown by American Airlines as well as TTA, which was Trans-Texas Airways which became Texas International, which became Continental. And uh, still a lot of DC-3s flying today. We took him through the aircraft. The aircraft is open on special events that will have people come through, and, but it's not always open to the public. But we'll go through it now. Amazing aircraft, certainly. Wow. As you can see, 16, over 16,000 of them were constructed. You the have the, the death door. Yes. <laughs> so you had to have the propeller turned to be able to open the door all the way. And this one has the uh, TTA speed mod on it. On, on it that, TTA uh, speed Trans mod? Trans-Texas. Trans-Texas one. They had a modification that they actually picked up a little bit of speed, air cooling, things like that. But, oh, uh, very neat. And these under here, these are just the oil coolers. Yes. They're not, it's not a uh, alternator generator like Correct. some of the old. Correct. Thing. Okay. Oil cooler. And you can, this angle you can see Look at all the rivets and all hand done. Fabric on the control surfaces control here surfaces. as well. Correct. Yeah. 
and big old flaps that go all the way the full length. Those are, are those Fowler flaps that go underneath and all the way? Is that what those are? There's a certain name for them that are like on the T6 and are they called Fowler flaps? Yeah, I'm not sure if these are Fowler or not, quite frankly. Ooh. Wow. So it's a strange sensation walking onto the aircraft because you're walking uphill. <laughs> and if you're old enough, it brings back memories of being a kid and flying on these. I'm not old enough to, to, uh, to have flown on DC-3s like that, but I can imagine how it's just amazing. And at that time, Wait. flying was different. People dressed up to go somewhere. It was an event. It was an event. And, and they would uh, you know, get their best suits, you know, their Sunday best, if you will, That's and right. to, to do that. It was All right, a flashlight yeah. if you want to see All right, inside. We'll, uh, and, uh, we'll go in and... and it, Light the way, watch your head. Whoa, this is like a for real airliner set up in here. Your overhead baggage. Your Which were for blankets and hats, nothing heavy. Oh yeah, that, that makes sense. Carry-ons. Wait, look at the difference in leg room you get. Okay, Southwest and Take all note. the others. Take note. On uh, normal flights, that seat would be right there. Yeah, this, look at that, my feet go almost, oh, that is, I think I'd rather fly on this. Just leg room, there's two people and, wow. Oh yeah, cause it's angled. Yes. <laughs> it's hard to get <laughs> out. Whoa. So I'm looking at this and I think we have to take note for the Elvis jet, we need to put, a runner like this down the middle of the uh, Elvis jet if we're gonna have a bunch of people come through it. Cause it has, it's all carpet, red, right. like shag velour carpet. That's not something we added. That was something that was on the aircraft. Sure, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, makes, makes a whole lot of sense. So we got baggage up here. And of course you got your crew right there. And again, I'm noticing some more modern avionics up there. So yeah, it's uh She's a flyer, boys. Wow. And we got a hatchet in case things get out of hand. We got to take out some passengers that are trying to get rowdy. This is pretty cool. How much fun would that be to like fly one of these? Because this oh, is the it, family hauler right here. Yeah, it's an event. And uh, you're not getting there in a hurry, but. Certainly, well, you're not, but certainly <laughs> a lot of fun. And get there in style. Is this a lab? This was correct. This was lab. Here, this is for plug. We put some lights at the top here, but you can see. That's oh, the there you go. Sink and everything in there. Sure. I mean, yeah, you gotta sanitize, man. Keep wash your hands. And, and, and then, then the back was for cargo. Oh, that makes more sense. And baggage, etc. Oh yeah. And then your coffee and tea area e right here. Exactly. This station where they would uh, prepare their drinks and food, whatever it might Hi. be. And just storage up top. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Welcome to Jimmy Airways, where we make it most of the time. Uh, buckle up, sit back, and stay alert because we may need your help. Feeling pretty good about today. Feeling pretty good, good. about today. Both <laughs> engines started. Enjoy your flight. And then inner phone to talk to the crew up front. Oh, yeah. And... Did that's, both engines actually start yeah. this time? Oh, that's good, okay. Oh, I, this is the millennial people. Yeah. Uh, this is what we would call a telephone, not, and you actually... And, and this is... This is a, a cord, so you knew always where to have it. Now, there is one thing I really miss about these phones, the satisfaction of hanging Hang up. Because now you just go, oh yeah? And then you could go, oh yeah, wham, and it would make the ding noise. The that's ding. right, that's right. By the way, you can't, cannot text on that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you could if you just do 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 Which was a different skill set. This is too stinking neat. Wow. And this is owned by the museum as well. Correct. This is the museum's aircraft. And, wow. Um, I mean, just really, and it was it a passenger plane the whole time? 
It was. This never flew as cargo. actual DC-3 passenger and plane. It flew as, as I mentioned, uh, I, believe, I think American Airlines at one time, and then Trans-Texas Airways, or TTA, and then Texas International, and then became Continental. So, very cool airplane. So, and at that time, when this was operating as a regular flight, people dressed up. It oh, was yeah. an event, like we were talking about. It was fun to go somewhere, and it was an event. And in today's dollars, it was not that it was all that cheap. It was expensive back then too, in those those days dollars. So first class. Su- it's all first class in that yeah. regard, and one class, and you were more susceptible to the weather because you couldn't go as high. That because it's so unpressurized. Unpressurized, yeah. And bouncing around a little more. So my younger days, I was fortunate enough to know a number of pilots that flew DC-3s way back when, including this airframe. And he had a lot of stories to tell. And man, that was that was flying. I, you weren't flying a computer, you were flying the aircraft. Yeah, you weren't managing systems. That's right. You were flying, That's right. you were sticking rudder skills. Absolutely. Oh, cool. All right, well, thanks for that. Fly All Continental right. Airways. And don't forget, we got to keep it locked because, you know, heathens around trying to get in airplanes they don't belong in. I'm really talking about myself more than anybody. So this would have been the cargo door here then. That's correct. Hinge. External from outside. Yeah. All right. That's my drum solo days. Look at the size of that rudder. <laughs> it is a, that's, yeah, that's a good size. So a lot of uh, rudder action, certainly. That is just too neat. Whoa, and then we step way back in time. This is a, a triad and it's a model, not a flying aircraft. We show it to display now the early, early days of flight. Obviously a pusher. Curtis. Engine. Jimmy, we're looking for a test pilot. Are you interested? You know, Silas, he's coming up. He's, okay. Yeah. We can turn the engine off and he can be certified as a glider well, solo in that. It's more of a rock than a glider, but. Uh, <laughs> like a yep. steering wheel with cables and you pull, like that is rudimentary as That's it right. gets. That it is. This would fall and, under the experimental category. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And a float plane. And if, I mean, naturally. So, with, with your uh, stabilizer booms. Yep. And wheels. Just in case. Yeah, just. Yeah, you never know. This is a Mooney Mite. <gasps> the Mooney Mite. Is that the one you're thinking? That's the one I was thinking yep. of. This is a Mooney Mite, and uh, it's actually a brand new airplane. has never been registered. And we've left it in this configuration to show students where a STEM based program here at Lone Star Flight Museum to show students what's underneath. What does it look like without the covering on there? Uh, So, hence a lot of the tags to show them what it is that's on there. Oh, Uh, yeah, there you go. Small engine, I haven't put the prop on it yet. Your magnetos, those are really, wow. Yeah, they are. That's some old magnetos. Is this a C, what, 65? Uh, I think it is a 65. Yeah, because those are small cylinders. Now, I want you to notice what material this is made out of. You're correct. This is laminated wood. Is this birch? It looks birch to me. Birch? I mean, you uh, could tell me it's oak, and I have no, no idea. No, it wouldn't be oak. Kind of heavy, I imagine. Exactly. But the uh, SAL, the P-51 Mustang kit plane that, that I bought that's in Texas, that's what this looks like under that layer of... Bondo epoxy and paint, it's made out of this wood. And my understanding is he bought that as just blueprints and Mm. he had to go get the wood and make the glue and laminate it. And each layer is at a 45 degree angle. You can see right there for strength. For strength, that's right. So if you look, this, so the, uh, what's under here, and this is, I don't know, three or five layers or something. It's super, super thin. So they'd have one layer that go this way They'd put another layer on at 90 degrees or 45 degrees or something like that with this special glue that they would make and then form in these jigs and then go. It's just 
the like, amount of craftsmanship it was to go into off the it, chart back then again different people that's right it's interesting because if you had them all at the same angle you would have break points right and but with this way it gives each other each layer strength that's right so as i say we display it this way without the skin on it to show what's underneath what does it look like and now would this all be fabric right yes here? correct okay and then sewn to each yeah each rib so which we will look at it some uh, the ceremony some other aircraft and how okay. they they stitch and how that shows back behind us here we have at Lone Star Flight Museum we have this is a honeybee it's referred to the San Diego Aviation Museum has one and it, it looks like a cross between a 150 and a bonanza retail <laughs> bonanza that's what i was looking at a cub uh yeah piper cub and a 150 and a bonanza these were very few oh yeah here we go yep exactly very few made weird and this was a, a local gentleman and uh that very was few not completed. is one yes and each one being individualized and obviously experimental but there's a, a second one which is actually this was Serial number two, I believe, in, in San Diego, uh, they, they have a um, museum there, but very rare in that regard. And it's kind of cool to see, here's the wing for it. Uh, it's a, a pretty big wing. It is. And so we display it on a stand for space purposes. I mean, for the size of the airplane, that wing is massive. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Serial number HB2. Yeah, look yeah. at that. And then number one was in Honeybee, is HB, and then first one was in is in San Diego. An unusual aircraft. That's and, neat. And uh, very basic. We're very yeah. pleased here at Lone Star Flight Museum at Ellington to in Houston to display. This is PHI helicopter. Oh. And uh, it's extremely popular among kids. Feel free to sit in it. Oh, look like now this one looks like it. Was it has flying. a lot. Oh, it was. It had a lot of time on it. Uh, they brought it to us just like this and on a truck though and it's got this the stubby uh, blades on it yeah that that makes it go faster it, they spin really fast yes <laughs> yeah and then here's here's a, a, a propeller or a, a blade that shows honeycomb what it's made of oh really oh yeah because the cutaway up here exactly whoa that's cool and this aircraft has a lot of time on it was it and so who is phi like what what's the, the phi is a, is a company out of Louisiana, I believe headquartered, but they're Houston. They fly a lot of offshore. They fly medical flights, and and uh, they were gracious enough. This one came to the end of its service life. Okay, I was and, gonna, that's a huge a, amount of seating in this thing. Uh, there is a tremendous amount. You see One, three two, rows. Let's see, 412, 13, 14, you know, seats in here. I don't know what the useful load or anything like that. And then is that more cargo space back there? Correct. Holy moly. Look at this, 600 pounds back here. Just in the back. Just in the back. Lord have mercy. Aircraft, especially helicopters, are very weight sensitive. So you want to, you can imagine, who are we waiting on? One more passenger. <laughs> uh -oh. We're waiting on Tiny. Yeah. You know, and Tiny shows up, he's going offshore and he's got his tool bag with him. And so, you know, very weight sensitive. Wow. Because you, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful this central point that all the lift, and so if you have more weight up there, it goes like this, right. and it's all three dimensional this way. Absolutely. Much more sensitive. Absolutely. So, but. Uh, and the pilot, so with helicopters, the pilot in command actually sits on this side, not that side like in an airplane. So that's. But uh, it's capable of being flown from both sides, but you are correct. So that's Jimmy's World's next step, is we need to find us a helicopter. I don't, I don't know if this would make quite a good trainer, <laughs> but yeah, we need to, you know, do that. Basically, you go up and down, and this is your steering, and that for the rudder is really the tail and makes it spin. Controlling the speed of the blade back there. Yeah. yeah. And if you ever look at a, it's fascinating because these blades, they're not at the same pitch the whole time they're going around. Every single time it goes around, they go like this yeah. and so that it keeps it flying however i mean the math that somebody had to come up with on the what is a swash mr plate. da vinci are you referring to yeah exactly that guy you know he's been a, it's been a minute <laughs> but yeah there's a big plate up there that's basically a wobble plate and makes each one of the blades rotate ever so slightly on every single Dangle. revolution yep. it's just it's it's amazing piece amazing machinery wow yeah we need a all right, Sparks, uh, game on. Oh, and, you know, Cletus, like, yeah, we'll, we'll be seeing you. 
Jimmy, let's step into what we refer to as the Lone Star Flight Museum Space Gallery, Space Corner. This is a lunar rover. They picked up an alien. Yeah. <laughs> and is this a real one? It's a trainer. It's absolutely used, was used by NASA astronauts and, and others as training. Six Ooh. tires on each side and they're independent. So they can climb, they can turn, they can pivot and controlled up from, from in there. And again, we've got some Halloween decorations going on, but we open up for tours inside of this periodically. Oh yeah. And, uh, and lit up, but driven from up front. These are low pressure tires. I imagine not a lot of pressure on the no. surface on the moon. of yeah. the moon, yeah. Correct. And we put up a moonscape behind it to show that. Okay, yeah. This referred to, we refer to as the Robonaut. And <laughs> Uh, it was there to collect samples and, and other things and kind of he doesn't usually have this on. This here, in, Gene Cernan was a Houston resident and uh, astronaut and obviously uh, landed on the moon. And uh, so, so is that him? I believe that is him, yes, oh, wow. on, on the moon and amazing gentleman, amazing man. This is the CCT-2, spent many years at NASA in Building 9 training astronauts. This and is the actual real, the that one that was there. Used for training. One of three that was there, wow. uh, they used in, uh, for each, each function. We've got three of interactive screens here that actually can, this is the mid-deck you'll see up in there. And oh, whoa. can spin. And it's all 360. This, yep, the side, side there as well. Oh, look at that. Summer screen on the side that goes through each mission, STS-1 through STS-135. And if you want to look at, this is the airlock right here. Oh, this is what you see and on the movies when they go. That's it. That's it. And they would go into this and then could lock the doors behind them and pressurize that and then depressurize. And then they would go out from, from this right here through this. They would it's open like it a, up. It's like a mudroom. It is exactly <laughs> like a mudroom. It's a space yeah. room. Vacuum mudroom. Yeah. So, but uh, that shows inside. And this is the airlock. We'll see in, inside of that in a moment here. This is the mid deck. And we'll see that better once we go inside. Wow. When this was at Building 9 at, at NASA before it came to Lone Star Flight Museum, and we're so thrilled to have it here. And we have regularly NASA people come through and tell us how thrilled they are that we have it and preserving it and showing it for local people. They can bring their families and explain to their kids, grandkids, and so forth what they did. This was actually on a platform that they could tilt up to 90 degrees. And so they could simulate getting in and getting in their suits and getting strapped in for a launch. We've got a seat downside, uh, outside, we'll look at here as we go by that and then one inside and then upstairs as well. So, so is that the seat they would have been in for correct. a launch? Correct. And, and those remove easily on the bottom and then collapse and then they would store them while they're up. I guess you never think about things like that. Like space the, is a premium. Yeah, and in space. Absolutely. Where you, yeah, you didn't space even, is a premium. <laughs> He's just so good, he just right into that. <laughs> Let's step on in and, <gasps> and look. This is the part that nobody else is allowed to do. So when you're in zero gravity, how do you sleep? You know, you, there's no bed. So they had sleeping bags that they would sleep in and you'll see Velcro a lot of places. <laughs> and that way they could, they could attach themselves or sleep and, and you, you'll see pictures of them sleeping sometimes with their arms kind of floating. How and weird would that so be? There's no up, there's no down. And then- What if you like drool when you're sleeping? Well, it, it, yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't go down, there's no down. So each of these would be lockers. I bet there are so many stories from that they don't share about the weird things like drooling while they're sleeping. Probably or, so, probably yeah. so. Uh, seated in these, and you can see they would have seats across here. So when they talk about in the mid deck, this is what they're talking about, where they would be in launch. And they would sit here. Now, you can see right here, there's no, no back. Well, they had a parachute on. And so they were seated here with the parachute, headrest, strapped in, extremely tight. I Extremely bet. tight. And they would sit here while they're waiting to launch. These were just so they could help pull up or down. Because, yeah, their suits and stuff were really heavy. Because on the bulky, ground, they were heavy and correct. bulky. It's something like 300 pounds. And once, or? not long after launch, and they get into into orbit, 
then they take that off and store that. And then from there on, they're in flight suits or they're in casual clothing, whatever it may be for, for comfort purposes. They don't wear shoes, they wear socks. Makes, don't need them. Makes sense. And uh, in fact, mission specialist, what that refers to there. Let's see if, here's what? <gasps> would wear something like this to keep their feet warm. Now those are some socks. As well as, you want to, if you want to turn the lights out, you have to do that. And a blanket. So they would each have you know, places that they would, that was empty, uh, that they would actually could store things. Food, clothing, experiments, all kinds of things they would need to store. So A vacuum cleaner. You got to cl clean up, yep. I guess. Underneath the, the floor as well, uh, some uh, areas as well that they can vacuum to connect and you can see uh, CO2 absorption. While they're in space, they all have to use one common restroom behind you. Oh, <laughs> this is the bathroom here. And each of them would have an adapter for their own personal use. Yeah, it's probably not something you want to share. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey Chuck, I know you had yeah. a Mexican one last night, but yeah. I think I need it here. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, this is a P tube. It's uh, or uh, something, or some sort of something. So that thing and it was curtain went, that like, came across right here, I believe. Suction to your behind, mm -hmm. and you needed a good seal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they actually would have to learn how to how to utilize it. I uh, yeah, that would be the most awkward, yeah. weird thing in the world. Be like, okay, here you go. Uh, no, it's got you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're so, going down. It's different. Probably, I imagine probably one of the most probably was not a problem up there. Yeah, probably not. Probably one of the most commonly asked questions is, how do you go to the bathroom in space? There you go. That's right. That's and, I, and I mean, it makes sense because you'd have to keep that under a pressure. You don't want that stuff floating around. Right. And that better have the best seal of anything That's in this correct. whole thing. That's correct. So they would learn to use that. Set commode control. Come on, dude. If I could have one of those <laughs> in my house, mode control. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's got handles to hold on to, like, that's like, yeah. you need that, like, ah, oh, Taco Bell Tuesday. It says no step, and the first thing I was like, why do they have a no step way up there? And then I'm like, zero gravity, this that's thing right. is not always that's going right. wherever. Up is so, not up. Yeah, they can have like no steps up here, and that's that's exactly why. Emesis bags? Mission specialist, MS. <sighs> ah, and Huggies, you know, the wipes. Who knew that aluminum foil and wet wipes came out of the space program? <laughs> I don't know if the space the wipes did, but it makes sense. Watch your head, and it's this is much easier in zero gravity. I imagine. Come on, this is awesome. I'm assuming astronauts couldn't have been super tall. It's easier for them if they're not. However, I know some that are probably six foot four. Really? They bang their head on everything. So this, is this the docking <coughs> thing that you see in the movies? Correct. Where he's got the handle and he's like... Psh, That's psh, correct. Psh, 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 psh. And as well as operating the Canada arm from back here. This is into the cargo bay. Oh, the big crane arm. That, mm -hmm, exactly. What did you call it? Car Canada arm. Canada arm? Why is it called a Canada arm? It was designed and produced there and that's just what I've always heard it called. Huh. So it's that articulating arm that they can manipulate after they uh some of the accidents they actually put a camera on there so they could go around and examine the orbiter that's a good idea and uh find if there were any issues man have the number of switches on this thing holy cow uh houston jimmy one is ready for launch i mean come on and, and you wouldn't have any duties until you get to a certain point in the profile, you're, just, you're a passenger on launch. That is fantastic. You got a rear view mirror. It, I say passenger, you're, you're monitoring a lot of systems, but, <laughs> but you're not controlling. Is it another joystick for like maneuvering the things? Is that what this would have been for? You know, I'm not sure what that one is. They had thrusters on the nose to maneuver in space a little bit. You know, yeah, that's what they just, you know, kind of mm -hmm. maneuver kind of that way. I don't know if that's if that's it or not. So you're sitting where, and not very long after that, people would be in space. God. And 
training in uh, that the commander's seat. It's weird, but it makes sense that you're in a space shuttle, but it still has rudder pedals. For landing? Yeah. Now it's the only time that those would be used. All right, so heading down. Yeah, there you go. And yeah. then there, and then there's a handle right there under your right foot. Three points contact at all times facing the like object. It, like I say, down. it's much easier in zero gravity. This is the extension I was talking about that would telescope oh. out, that they would slide out on. And uh, so this is that. Correct. Well, that's the slide that they could go down if they were no, on the like ground. This, this, this is. Is that. Oh, yes, that's correct. Yes, yeah. that is correct. And this is, is this. part of that. Correct. This is the door that goes right there. Oh. The door itself weighs 298 pounds, we'll call it 300 pounds. Yeah. You can see all the locking mechanisms. They really want around. a good seal on that yes. thing. Yes, correct. And then the seat that just like the one we had inside and then they easily release on the bottom and then collapse and in the pumpkin suits that it, it makes it much more restrictive much more difficult to maneuver around in there you know shorts and a t-shirt yeah. Uh, yeah parachute that they would use and they would wear and you saw on the seat kind of velcro and the padding where it would be up against that oh and there's the and velcro strips right on this exactly side. yeah exactly to hold it in, Help hold it in place. This is the trainer. It's called the SMSMB uh, shuttle motion based or shuttle mission simulator motion based that every astronaut in the program from STS 1 to the last one, STS 135, trained in. This is a the console over here is the instructor console that they would give them all the variables and uh, create a uh, give them master alerts exactly and whatever and, and failures and whatever they else that they might want to. Oh. This was also a full motion. We don't, we don't operate that way. This is actually a picture of the last, in July of 2011, the last shuttle landing, STS-135. And you can see the vortices coming off the wingtips. That's an actual picture? Yes. Whoa. Night landing. <laughs> wow. This one shows a lot of the medical that they would have. Uh, these actually were folded in like books. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, there's the socks. They get in there, yeah. Acorn slipper socks. They should really, like, come out with those again. <laughs> those would be fantastic. So this is where you were sitting in the CCT, the crew com uh, compartment trainer, and this is the shuttle flight simulator, full motion at, when they were using it. And, and these buttons actually do things. Correct, correct. Wow. And re would respond to their inputs. Yeah. Took a lot of training and a lot of skill, a lot of nerve. Mm-hmm. Schnikes. And you think taking an abandoned airplane that had been sitting for a minute <laughs> and flying it was questionable at best. I mean, this is not questionable, but you got one shot at it. And this is only one of the hangers. hangers so the other hanger actually has more aircraft in it. Okay, well, let's go. Would Noah Can go absolutely nuts in here? Because they're using they, like X-Plane or something? Yes, very similar to it. And control tower back here that they actually launch it. They can set all kinds of different conditions. And the kids can get an ex a feel for it, an experience for it. And so all it right. would take, take the, somebody at the, uh, at the desk back here. Oh, okay. But, you can't. You know, throttle, rudders, Flaps all up. that. A little 172. Take off from, <laughs> and we typically will suggest they'll take off from here at Ellington, where Lone Star Flight Museum is, and fly to Galveston. Wow, and Redbird. Yes. And I noticed, I don't, is it, maybe it's in the hall down there, but I did spy a real simulator. It's right through here. Okay, and you can actually log real time in your log book, if all the paperwork's in the, you know, the right thing. But you can log actual time in one of these simulators and it counts toward all your training and things. Yes, this. Look at that monster right there. <gasps> we actually cool have we actually have right now a grandfather who's an airline pilot teaching his grandson to fly right now in this. And, and he bought a block of 10 hours simulator time and can be set up as different aircraft. Oh yeah, yeah that makes you know, sense. So it, you're exactly correct, it's loggable. 
So yeah, this is a room we show uh, get through the STEM based program here at Lone Star Flight Museum. Navigation, and each station is a little and bit that different. Evil little no, this isn't the E six B, but those are evil too. I yep. I never quite got that. <laughs> charting, charting. Let's talk about weight and balance, and what impact does does it have when you, where you place the weights and you see a you can see the bubble up there and uh, okay we're weighted to the front. What do we need to do? Well, we can add weights. Is it too much? And as it settles down. So an illustration to show how important weight and balance is on an aircraft to, uh, to have that. Otherwise, you get too nose heavy or too tail heavy. So, and if it's too aft, it's unrecoverable spin. Absolutely. And, yeah. Nose heavy is not good either. Yeah. But Preferred over if you're gonna if you're gonna have a problem yeah yeah each of these characteristics you know oh, yeah. we'll look at and from uh, instrumentation and we show pressurization right here you can see uh, I was gonna I was wondering what, is, what impact yeah, yeah. does that have and there's a there's a pump that goes oh there with you it. go so less pressure means higher altitude so that and, they, and you is. were climbing there and then this one and then you have two different diaphragms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, just as an illustration cool. to show weather. Oh, they got the vac, the balloon, and the vacuum thing to blow it up to. Okay, that's cool. Weather, and then uh, we actually, and some of these are duplications, so we can have more, more young folks in here to, to experience it. We actually have a little wind tunnel right there. What? Oh, come on! That's cool. So once those little flappy things no longer stick, there's your stall. Oh, getting, that's not stalled, stalled. See how the wing doesn't separate and it's not creating any lift at that point? Ah, now you're screaming. Okay. So that's again, STEM-based program to give young folks that information, that, that experience. What does it look like? And then you have an entire airplane in this room. This is actually the aircraft that Mooney used to certify for this type. For the ovation? Yes. Wow. The actual aircraft. And so when they were finished with it, they donated it. And uh, we had to, we were just about to move into the facility, so we had to time it so we could get it in before we completed the walls <laughs> yeah, and, the, and the glass work. But as you walk around, that's cool. As you walk around, you see, well, wait a minute, that, that's not supposed to be that way. You know, low tire. Wait a minute, there's a bird's nest. Well, we do that to show pre-flight. And so there are issues on this aircraft oh. that people will look at and uh, that, that so will like, show. What, yeah, what would be one? Where you, so as you're pre-flighting an airplane, typically you'll come around this way and go that way. How's that fuel look? I mean, that's normal to me. A little smidge dark. A little, little dark. Yeah, a little bit dark. Yeah. So I don't know if I'd want to fly with that. Those tires look all right to you? No, yeah, they're fine. Really? You send it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we like to have a little more air in ours. Um, Oil stain, what about, I'm assuming that's supposed to... That uh, is correct. Okay, simulate. So what about in the cowling? Everything look okay? Here, come to this side. That's how most of my airplanes are found. <laughs> so <laughs> We so, go in and say hi. Okay, look at this. What about the cowling? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Clearly, Jimmy just got done doing something. So, <laughs> Ooh, yeah, yep, that's... There you go. So there's blue, which is 100 low lead. Red was 80. Red, this, so this is 80? Originally, it was used as 80, yes. Okay. Uh, the color, they add the dye turn. No, you can tell which one. Green was 100, 130. Yeah. And uh, so. Because I was going to say, I was like, I'm not familiar with red unless it was you like off-road diesel. We haven't seen that in a long time. Yeah, unless it's off-road diesel or something. Well, exactly right. And that's the purpose that they dye those <laughs> so that the tax man can tell which fuel it is, is the tax being applied correctly. Yeah. That dye is added. That's right. Yeah. So. Yep, that's right. But that's right. again, now, I, this I is. I noticed that these have even speed brakes on it. The Mooney? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these, these are come supposed up like to be 200 knot plus airplanes. They're fast. Yeah. They're fast. Very slick. We want to illustrate to, to young folks coming in, you don't just get in and go. It's not like your car. 
so you have to do that inspection and so these sacrificial things are there for them to catch that's right as they go around we'll go back through this way to the other hanger we're talking about yeah get into a, a pitts airplane or something and count all three of your touch and goes every landing yeah that's right <laughs> so, and now you're current uh, which way we'll go out this go? way all right <gasps> this is our second hanger. No way do you guys have one of these. And the tail number is November 666. This is a visiting aircraft, actually. A gentleman out of California that came down for the air show a couple weekends ago. And uh, we'll be here for a little bit. So it's playing the month. It's How cool uh, is that? It's a Quickie Q2 with a 0200 engine in it. Exactly. You know why I know that? How do you know that? Evergreen Museum has one. Oh, really? And it's been sitting in their museum forever. Yeah. And they, one of the things was to see if we can get it running again. Yeah. And so we went out and went through it and got it fired up. It started so easy and it was just like it had it's, been running yesterday. It's a slick airplane. He cruises like 150 on four and a half gallons an hour. Golly, So that is as crazy. a former fuel sales guy, I told him that's just wrong. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> this is the steerman that you'll be in tomorrow Ooh, uh, so cool. why don't we start with this one and then we'll, okay, yeah, we'll let's move, go. move over so that looks um, like a ranger inverted six cylinder it's exactly engine. what it is fairchild yes. f24 ah here we go and this one won bronze lindy at oshkosh this year 2023 wow at, uh, so that's a beautiful airplane it is a amazing and gentle you're not going very fast but really really nice aircraft Wow. This is actually our Chairman Laborde's aircraft. I can see why. So he's had a number of aircraft and he's, uh, he's doing some panel mods. What year would this thing? I think this was, was it 42 or three? Yeah, right, the dashboard right there. And it, it, there's an instrument being worked on this, why that panel covers off, but it's got Johnson bar for the flaps. Next to the, uh, the Stearman, yeah. we have two Stearmans and this one, is painted in Army Air Corps colors. Okay. And it has a Jacobs engine on the nose. The other one has a Lycoming. Okay. So and this one is the 7670? I can't even tell. It's hard to read on that. Model 755 Bravo 2. Let me look here. 275 horse. There you go. Correct. The R670. Okay. And a lot of the aircraft is fabric, except where there are high temps. Makes sense. Uh, so. And these little orange lines on the bottom of the cylinders is chrome cylinders. As you mentioned, we will rotate the prop. We usually pull these through by hand, mm. make sure the mag's off. And uh, at least one revolution per cylinder mm -hmm. to redistribute oil and make sure we don't get a hydraulic lock. And right. uh, that, it's rare that we, that we have that issue. We'll show people and talk about how the cooling fins, uh, additional, you know, two spark plugs per engine and the, the you know, the, the cycles of, of compression and explosion yeah. and then exhaust and the valves is. Now these, the old one, oh, it still has it. So this one, you don't crank up like that. We anymore. don't. Okay. We have a crank, but we don't use it. On, so on these before battery and electric starter you'd take a rod in this thing like an old car and you'd go woo, woo, and it would spin a flywheel inside there and you're like woo, woo, getting that thing going and then this is the primer here and then there was there's a push button somewhere to I engage it. I think it's inside it. isn't it? No I thought it was, was right it here as well yeah so you would prime the engine here with fuel and then you'd crank it over and then it might have been this thing right here but then you'd push on it and it would engage a clutch to the flywheel that you've got spinning to the actual crank of that and get this sucker spinning to start up. Uh, we were talking about the fabric earlier and how you can, you can feel the, the stitches mm -hmm. you know, on, oh, yeah, on the ribs as they, as they would do it. There's and then the one, yeah. pinking tape, which was a jagged edge, having an edge like that prevented it from peeling and rolling as much. So pinking was what that was referred to. And so they would put, in the early days, it was, it was used as a grade A cotton fabric and then put the butyl dope and all that and then paint it and the butyl dope would make it taunt. This is a poly nylon material, several different products that are out there for it and it should make it last a lifetime on mm -hmm. it as opposed to the cotton that was 
two, three, four, five years. Uh, I also, I was reading, and I, maybe you can confirm, intentionally it was designed to be difficult to ground handle. They took the gear and they narrowed it because it's a very narrow gear. They could have easily have made it a which, lot wider. Which makes it more... And yeah. the gas tank was up top, so all of your center of gravity was up top and it was all really 40, difficult. 46 to, gallons up there, exactly yep. right. Contrary to what you're describing, we'll get to it, uh, a Fairchild mm. uh, PT-19 primary train with a 24 on the nose. And it was considered too easy to fly and was not as accepted by the military at that time because and it's a fabulous aircraft to fly in. And we, that was the one I forget earlier. That we have cell okay. rides on that one also. Oh, okay, uh, fun. And it is a joy to fly and easy to land. This one taught them the skill sets better. That's right. And so they, they wanted something that, you know, recreationally. Well, they kind of separated that's a, the pilots from the maybe absolutely. navigators. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> that's a joy to fly. But this one teaches you skills more. Yeah. Tough airplane. Yeah. As an owner pilot to fly one, you want that one. As somebody training to go into real stuff, you need yes. to be in this one. Yes. You'll enjoy it tomorrow. Real pleasure to fly. Well, and I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to go around to the other sure. side because this is your oil. That is correct. That side. So again, high tech, low back. tech solutions to high tech problems. You see the fuel gauge hanging down that tube, and it's just a float in there. And so before our flights tomorrow, a quarter tank. Yeah, just just about, which still gives us about an hour. But we'll we top it off, and we usually. Uh, fly it with no less than half tank. This was after a flight yesterday, actually. Cool. Tomorrow, my tomorrow, but you're here in just a few minutes. We'll be flying this bad boy. World War II, they would start, as, as I mentioned, with the PT-17 or the PT-19, more commonly the PT-17, and then go to the BT-13 over here. That's which, right, because it was fixed gear version of this it, with less horsepower, essentially. It, uh, yes, but the big step, each one of these was a big step. Basic trainer, the BT, uh, oh, built by Volti. So they called Volti Vibrator. Was PT the primary, primary trainer, trainer BT basic, basic, AT advanced. advanced. I don't think I ever put that together. Once you master this, and that's why they call this the pilot maker. Once you master this, you can fly anything. In fact, I've heard the joke said that the P51 is there to teach you how to fly the T6. <laughs> it's it's easier. So just a tremendous airplane. Again, it's solid like like a lot of these. Bigger engine, 600 horses, and is really throaty. They won't hear it in the cockpit, but as they, when he goes full throttle for takeoff, and you have to be very gentle because P factor, you go too fast and it's going to really give you an issue. But the tips of the prop are right there, kind of like a Huey, whop, whop, whop. Mm. Same thing with the tips of the prop on this. Yeah. And they then once they break ground, they come noise. back on the throttle and it quiets out. There's the penny. Exactly. With the year of the model or the, the, the engine. Uh, overhaul. Yeah. And it was only the 1340s. Because the other ones, they didn't have this for the size mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Yep. <laughs> That's weird. Exactly correct. That's so fun. This is our T41 next to us. A Cessna 172 on steroids, if I you will. I was going to say, yeah, this one looks like it's a little beefier. It, it is. It's got like a 215 horse engine in it and constant speed and flies more like a 182. That's what I thought it was, was a 182, but I guess the it, fuselage area is not as big. Yeah, it's, it, it's the IO360 on it. It's a fun airplane and we sell rides in it and tomorrow we've got a ride in it as well. Oh, that's so pretty it's pretty standard in there. U.S. Air Force Academy used them for a period of time and they were used all the way, in, including in Vietnam, for various reasons. Mm. So. Oh yeah. It's just like 172, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. And there you go, boys. But a fun airplane, particularly with that extra horsepower. Oh, that makes a nice difference. There you go. Neat. Fighting Mescalero. Right. Mescalero. Mescalero. It's Native Americans in New Mexico. Man, that's an old school right there. And then this is the BT-13, Consolidated Vaulty. Excuse our Halloween yeah. decorations as well. A big step from the Stearman to this. Yeah, you can tell this. it's just a smidge smaller than the T6 yes. all the way around. Fixed gear, but it has, yeah, you can see the transition. Exactly. Interesting. A much wider gear. Getting them used to the systems and they're starting to get that design. And, and you see the antenna up top as well that we were talking about, naval aircraft. Yeah. 
this one was. Probably starting to get them more familiar with actual navigating. It, exactly. And the real operations and that kind of thing. And these exactly. are only like 400 horse or something. This aircraft is a special one that we don't fly anymore. It flew in. Okay. But, uh, Twin Comanche is one of our members of the board, very fine lady. She and her mother flew this around the world. Whoa. And then she what? flew it by herself uh, a second flight later around the world. This is actually the track that she went in. Here's a spreadsheet of the times and the locations. Really? Because I yeah. want to know how she made the leap because she had to land in Russia right here. Yes, correct. Because that is the tricky one. Is well, going started here, I think, uh, was it Toronto? Uh, Montreal. Montreal, and then across, and then you're correct. These are the scary ones. Mm -hmm. And then it has to be a certain distance, obviously, and so this talks about that. And this is one of the 11 tanks, and they were not all the same size, of course. <gasps> you know, but oh, this is a gas tank. Correct. 11th fuel tank, 72 gallons. Oh, my Lord. And she's an amazing lady, and we've talked about it. I said, you know, when just an airplane, you fly at night, boy, you got your ears on that. I can't imagine being out here nowhere to land, you really listen to that engine, make sure that it's purring and, mm, did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, yep. that is what, yeah. You're right about that, especially when you have family with you or something like that, you're listening to the vibrations, you have your feet down there and you're just like, Ooh. and then you, even the slightest, you're like, what's that, what's it's, that? It, it's stressful. It is, it is, and she did it twice, once with her mother and then once, once her on her own. So here's a picture of she and her mother, in fact, down here for the first flight. Oh, wow, 21,000 miles in 12 days. <gasps> and Pat Kiefer is the, this is Pat, and she is uh, one of our members of the board and quite distinguished individual to have done this, certainly. That's, that's pretty cool. Wow, I didn't, that's, oh, wow. This is our Howard 250. And what originally is a, that thing? Originally a Lockheed, Keed? Lockheed Lowstar. And, converted to tricycle gear. Oh, that sounds like, because they used to be a tail dragger, right? Correct. So we actually had to construct some steps back there because the door comes down and the bottom of the door is about here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because it's no longer sitting on the tail. And so we have to push the, uh, the wooden steps up to get inside, but. Oh, okay, uh, I see. Doesn't it, look, it just looks fast sitting here, doesn't it? It does, it's kind of. It's got the two right 1820s, you know, 1,350 horses each, speed of 278, cruise of 230. It definitely, you can tell there's that Lockheed-ness about it. Yes. The longer pointy nose, the kind of chunky. Kind of T-33-ish. Yeah, yes, yep. And just huge engines. How big engines can we stick on this thing? That's right. Oh, man, oh yeah, cool. Now. Get some Jeeps, the old Harley, the little L19, I'm assuming is what that. Uh, no, be. that's a, the L19 is down Are, here. This is a four, L4. Okay. Uh, the, the, the Piper Cubs. Yeah, yeah two there of them. You go. This Harley is actually, a, I believe, 1942. It's a WLA, which was the military version of the, the uh, WL, I think they call it. And uh, That's pretty cool. And it, it runs, it ran, uh, it last ran uh, two weeks ago. A little less than two weeks ago here at the air show. Yeah. This is the L4. We've got two of them here in in the hangar and Topper. they basically the Piper Cub, yeah. the exception was they had plexiglass roof inside. Oh yeah. And a different that. paint job. Other than that, they're pretty much a cub. Yeah. Now do Doors they use down. these for uh, training or were these used? They were for, observation. Yeah. And uh, you know low altitude they, observation. They, they actually uh, this was the first and the army said we need something we need more we need faster we need to be able to get heavier and so they developed the l5 which was by stenson which c could carry a lot more get in they actually the l5 had a the, the ambulance model the g model could open the door on the side and put a leader in there and carry people off the battlefield oh, to a wow. hospital there so was they an l3 land in real short distances a, a ronca built them exactly they're very much stall airplanes amazing short field capabilities but uh, these you know somebody originally said man it looks like a grasshopper and hence the name stuck there you go uh you had, you mentioned the l19 this is l19 vietnam era the ocean paint on it. I mean, who doesn't want some rockets on the side of their airplane? You talking about the trailing gear on that aircraft earlier. Well, this with the spring gear, you got to roll it on or you're going to 
<laughs> it's going to launch you again. Really a cool airplane. Tandem seat in it. They sit up a lot. That's correct. Because, oh, the guy in the back was sitting backwards. I mean, you, you they look kind of sort of like, oh, it's just a Cessna you know, 140 or something, but it's not Well, it's all. based on the 170. Oh, okay, yeah. But updated and steroids. And this one's not an annual as well, so, uh, so we have the do not fly sign on there. That's the reason. But otherwise, uh, it just needs gas and go. I mean, some maintenance and inspection and call really just day. inspection. Okay. Well, this is the Luscombe Observer. All right. And has kind of a wide, a bulbous back seat there. It's two oh, place. Oh, yeah, look at that. Uh, now I noticed what was overhead of. Uh, yeah, I was going to point that. that out. That is an MQ1 Predator here at Ellington Field, where Lone Star Flight Museum is located. Uh, the 147th flies UAVs and. This is the earlier version. They now fly the MQ-9 Reapers, and this is MQ-1. And then I noticed you got something else hanging over there upside down and kind of... That is. That, uh, it's a Culver Dart light aerobatic. You wouldn't get into like serious aerobatic competitions, but it does. it is capable of aerobatics and that being hung and, and, and in a manner that shows that. So. Yeah. What I love is you can see the uh, angle yep. that the wings are at. Yep. And the, I find it interesting as well that it, it sat here for quite a while, and we just hung this not long ago, and from different angles, it has different appearances kind of to it. Hmm. And right here, it, just like you say, with the wings like that, it kind of has the almost dihedral, a... dihedral, that's the word I'm yeah, looking for. Yeah, there you go. Oh, this is the little this, trainer here. Yeah. Exactly. This is the PT-19 Fairchild, and has the same engine as we looked at earlier, the Ranger, 200 horse. And just an absolute pleasure to fly. Too easy. <laughs> so that's why the Army Air Corps said, we, we, we need something. We're not training the pilots like we want to, the skill set that they need. So they kind of de-emphasize this and emphasize the, uh, the Stearman more. This is built 1941, mostly fabric, and just a very basic mm -hmm. aircraft. This up here on the top is actually kind of like a roll bar. That if you were to flip oh, over, would save the pilot from being crushed. So that, oh, huh. And then now we look at how wide the gear is. Look, like that's eight, eight feet across where the steerman was probably five feet, four, four yeah. and a half, five feet. Well, you can. Oh, yeah, there you go. So just take a picture of this and you can see right here the difference. Much more narrow. Wooden, wooden prop as well. So um, come here and take look how wide it is right there. Like use my hand if you can see it. And then you go over there to the steerman, how narrow that is. And it sits up higher. The gas tank is up there instead of down here. So it really makes it a handful on the ground. This thing does kind of look like it'd be fun to fly. It is a, it's just so easy and smooth. This is our other steerman that's in navy colors. And you can see where fabric was tested right here, this little white patch. Oh, oh that. And using, using a mall tester to test the, the strength of fabric. The dimple or you push yeah, it Yeah, it's, it's an instrument that you push and it measures in foot pounds where it actually punctures it. And then you can tell, if you will, the health of the fabric, mm. how, if it still has its properties that way. And then because it's just a little hole, we put a patch over it. So yeah. exactly, different places. Each year you would do that on different places uh, on there. You Every do single year? Most, yeah, to test it. So. Good night. Yeah, it's, but this is really <laughs> like a lifetime now. So sure. it's not as done as, as, as frequently, but top and bottom, same 46 gallons of fuel, access panels, as you were talking about earlier. During World War II, the concept was this, the B-25 was not designed nor really to take off from an aircraft carrier. So they selected Lieutenant Colonel at the time, James Doolittle, Jimmy Doolittle, to organize a group. And they were, came from four squadrons, three of them in one wing. And they loaded, they trained, they trained to, to take off in a certain distance. And then they flew to San Francisco, loaded their 16 B-25s on this, the aircraft guard, CV-8 Hornet, and then steamed towards Japan. And the purpose was to get close enough that they could bomb Japan and then continue on into China and places like that that were 
at the time very were friendly to us. And it was in response. It was to in response to Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. That's exactly That's right. correct. So we had Pearl Harbor. We had to say, "Oh no, you ain't going to do that to us," and we got to come back and, and while, show them. While it did damage, it didn't. It didn't do a, a significant amount of damage militarily. What it did do was show the Japanese that they were they were vulnerable, mm -hmm. and so they pulled some of their some of their ships and some of their forces back to help protect the islands, uh, which opened up other areas for us. So it was, it was successful in that regard. This model is depicting those 16. This first one is Jimmy Doolittle took off the first one. And then we have seven of the Doolittle Raiders have signed this fuse box cover. Wow. They all passed away now. Uh, the last one alive was R.E. Cole, Dick Cole. It was Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot, lived over in the San Antonio area, and we participated in his memorial service. So all these gentlemen have either flown in this airplane or, or been here. And uh, so it's an important story to know wh what happened. And they were uh, truly amazing. If my memory is correct, there were two crews that did not survive it. The rest of them survived and were able to come back out and, and then fly again in other missions. But uh, none of the aircraft obviously made it. One made, went to Russia, we never saw again. The rest of them crashed various places, whether in the ocean or on land somewhere. So, mm -hmm. but, that was uh, a one-way trip. It was, and they knew it. Yeah. And they knew it. That's so, right. But we sell rides in this aircraft um, <gasps> because it is the official Doolittle Raider aircraft mm -hmm. in, that, in that regard by the Doolittle Association. Is it, I was looking around the entire thing trying to figure out where the door was. So that's the actual real door to get in. Absolutely, there's one in the back as well. <laughs> um, I would just ask if it's red, don't touch it. Uh, you can grab if it's yellow and watch your head on anything. So there's a handle as you climb up the steps right there, handle you can grab in there as well. So. Oh, this is the picture that's in the coffee shop. That's correct. Very neat. So this back here would be where your two co-pilots or these, your trainer seats? These refer to as the student seats. Student and seats. obviously we close the hatch and close the door so it's a solid floor that, right there. And then here they can they can see and, and uh, could swap out. The tunnel is right oh, here. And is that the spar you're talking about to climb over? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's it. And then and then we go climb to the back and then they can go, you can go all the way to the tail as well. Okay. That way. And, and there's uh, two more seats back in the tail? Four, no, there's just one seat. The t well, there's no seats or, at the I mean, tail. In the but back section. There's actually four seats back there. We fly with a crew chief, so he's back there, and he's monitoring engines. He's monitoring the passengers. Huh. Oh, I was like, there's a weird random, and that is the emergency uh, hydraulic yep. lock right there. Yep. Well, that's just a smart genius little thing. Simple. And this is hydraulic as well. This is accumulator right behind me. Oh here. yeah, and, uh, and then emergency brakes as well. That's why we say anything red, we don't uh, we don't mess with. Mm -hmm. Next week we've got two flights on it uh, on Saturday, and we fly fly regularly. This aircraft. It's, that's oh, the do, that's do little logo. About. Yeah. Wow, that is pretty cool. So that is too stinking cool. Here we got a random bomb. Yeah, this is a 500 pounder. <laughs> We're strong. So, wow, he is really strong. And uh, very a lot of kids have an interest in it, and but we use it to display. Here, um, can we pick it up and put it on my shoulder, so, and yeah. that'll be my picture. <laughs> there you go. Right. I was kidding. <sighs> That's fantastic. I want to get one of those just to have it like dangling under my truck or something yeah. <laughs> you know just, just call that the uh the complaint department yeah <laughs> have bad driving call 1-800 watch this yep <laughs> those are the aircraft we have currently here at lone star flight museum and we have new aircraft visiting aircraft as well as some of our own sometimes new ones coming in so um, we've got some pretty exciting plans on some aircraft coming up so and, you got uh, any that you're allowed to disclose what might be uh, making their way here? Sure. It's, uh, it, it's supposed to be in here, but because of weather. And so I expect in the next week to two weeks, we'll have another of Lewis Legends aircraft, the Glacier Girl, P-38. Nope. Oh, P-38? That was extracted from the ice, Greenland. It's that one? That one. That airframe. So 
Um, <sighs> it was supposed to have been here two weeks ago, three weeks ago, but because of weather, couldn't get it over. So, so they've been just fabulous to work with. And, and quickly telling them the Glacier Girl, it was, there was they a, went to go look for a B-17, right? Well, they were, they were going to Europe. There was a flight of five P-38s and two B-17s, and they, they kind of got lost, and so they used more fuel than they anticipated, and so Greenland was there, and so they said, let's, <laughs> let's land. And it's just ice capped. And so first one landed, gear down, and he flipped over. So the other four came in gear up, and they all made it out, made it back. Really? Uh, yes, and then they caught the lost squadron. Years later, some folks went to go find it, and it was under about 260 feet of ice uh, through, through the years that the ice had, had built up above it. So they mm -hmm. hot water drilled to get to it and, uh, and then extracted it. And they had done ground penetrating radar to figure out which one was probably in the best condition on that and uh, so they extracted it and then went through a restoration process and hence the name glacier girl wait it's not flying is it absolutely flies absolutely really i and, didn't think it was flying oh i want to say it was 2007 they completed the trip to europe in it uh oh, so the one they couldn't finish whenever exactly so come on lewis organization has been just tremendous to work with and you see the goodyear corsair which is just a stellar example of of a Corsair and so they've been gracious enough to allow to, us to display these and so we're looking forward to that arrival it's not here yet that but uh, we're so looking forward cool. to that so man no that's pretty neat that is cool sorry it wasn't now, here why, why would you have to come back well yeah. any any time yeah we'll, we'll just have to come back we'll take the steerman out this time maybe come back and take the the 25, 25 yeah, out next yeah. time yeah yeah each one's a little bit different experience yeah and but uh, we've never had anybody come back and say how was it Eh. Yeah, can I get my money back? Yeah, yeah. no, it's wow. Yeah. Oh, that's, we, that's we, we have folks from all over the world come in. We've had folks from Asia Pacific. Uh, <clears throat> yesterday we had a gentleman, he did two flights in two different aircraft, steerman and the T6, uh, from Switzerland. And uh, so people from Germany, people from all of the United States. And so it's a unique experience for them. They, they don't, that's not available to them very easily in, in their regions. So, that's true, yes. So I had one fun nugget of the steerman uh -huh. so let, let's go back up to the steerman sure so i've heard it said now how many gallons fit in this 46 46 gallons during right after the war the military was surplusing these out and i know from experience from buying stuff from the military they often will leave them full of fuel yes the people would buy these because it was cheaper to buy these with the amount of fuel they had in them than to buy the fuel itself. So they bought these, not for the airplane, but for the fuel. And for like, I don't know, less than $500 or an equivalent price of whatever it is today. And then crop dusting is ultimately what saved these airplanes because there was almost 10,000 of these made. Trainers, and once the war was over, these kind of didn't meet the mission anymore. And so now they just had to get rid of them. People bought them because they were full of fuel. And then the crop dusters learned that these handled really well and they could fit the front seat with all their hopper of exactly. stuff. Exactly. That was, that was where they put the, all the, the chemical, all the hopper, all the fertilizer, whatever they're going to do. Exactly. Yeah. Now, and then put spray bars underneath oh, the, yeah, the yeah, wing. Yeah, that's right. Now, if, if I read on the website correctly, either this one or that one was a crop duster. I believe it was this one. Okay. Um, so this one was a crop duster and that's how it was saved through those 50, yeah. 75 years. And they've been, re they've been restored and rebuilt through the years. And, and obviously, and uh, they go each year, they go through a rigorous annual and we're constantly, you know, in, uh, monitoring the health of the engine, health of the aircraft and pre-flighting and post-flighting and you know, all, all that with it, how it flies in flight. So, mm -hmm. um, and then making sure, cause the wings have to be rigged together and there's you know, certain the tension and all. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so, yeah, they're, uh, the fun airplanes, that's for sure, and uh, but that's pretty neat. Well, fuel has gotten even more expensive, <laughs> yes, uh, significantly more. Yes, it has. So, Ooh. but because uh, this thing will burn, I don't know, forty. No, not quite forty. The steer, the T six will burn about forty gallons yeah, an hour, or even 45. sometimes a little more. Yeah. Uh, this one, uh, thirty probably. 25 to 30, I think. Yeah. yeah. On, that's a small twin. Depends on how aggressive you are with yeah. the yeah, that's right. mixture. But well, cool. Could, well, I, yeah, I'm, gonna look, I'm looking forward. We get to go fly this. We're ready. Let's All go. Right. So in video world, let's see if I can do this transition correctly. Here we go. All right. 
Cameras Bill's are running. Yes, okay. Oh, can I get a clear wrap? All right, I'm with you. Hey, firm oil pressure up, temperature up. Wow, can you steer this thing straight or what are you zigzagging here? How much you had to drink? <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, not much. If I could see out the front, I wouldn't have to do that. So what is, the, the ground handling wise, is which is this the most difficult airplane to ground handle or what's your opinion on that? Uh, I don't know about the most difficult from some of the other ones I've flown. It has its moments, it's, it's a good crosswind. There's some airplanes that are super difficult to ground uh, handle. You know, I, I've got a lot of time in the pits. That can be a little, little difficult. But uh, at least with the pits, when you tell it to do something, it does it. With this thing, if it gets going one way, it just takes a while for it to come back. So you're kind of sitting there in limbo for a minute. Yeah, that pit's is a little tiny. It's very short, isn't it? Yeah, short couple. And then, uh, you know, some of the other airplanes we have at the museum, as far as like the T6. T6 is great, but once it gets, once it gets away from me, it's gone. You ain't no saving it. So <laughs> you just hold on, huh? It'd be a little challenging, but uh, you know we. Most of the guys here, we, we fly them up to stay pretty current, so, you know, but that being said, there's always a bad landing here and there. Right of that. And what's your background as piloting, or what's what's your story? Well, I uh, started flying when I was 14, 15 years old. I worked for, uh, you may have heard of Debbie Run Harvey, aerobatic lady. Right on. Worked for her for a number of years when I was a kid, kind of grew up around her, kind of became an honorary stepmom. I worked there for in high school, ended up going to the Houston Police Department. I was a police officer for a few years, and then, uh, then I got hired back at Continental back in 96, uh, so, uh, which came United. So I've been at United since uh, 1996. Were you flying for the Sheriff's Department? Uh, you know, not so much. That was the plan, but it never really, never really worked out like it was supposed to. I did get to fly over there some, which was, was kind of good, but... Uh, Ah, you know, I learned a lot, and I stayed as a reserve officer while I was at the airlines, just for a number of years as well. All right, trims are checked, flight controls are free, free and correct. And I think we're ready to go if you're all set up there. Ready up here. Yeah, off we go. Off the ground at 80 miles an hour, that's fantastic. That was Oshkosh Rocker Wingsworthy right there. There you go. You ever flown into Oshkosh? Yeah, I have. Boy, there's something special about an open cockpit, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard to beat. Wow, it's really not that far to Galveston, is it? No, it's probably about, uh, I don't know, 40, 20 miles as a crow flies. This is a great day to do a video with the clouds to give it some perspective. So, as a United pilot, what's the scariest flight that you've ever taken? What's the scariest thing that you've ever experienced as a, a pilot when you were flying commercial? Uh, you know, I don't know if anything super scary other than having to, you know, shut an engine down or something like that. So, you've had to shut an engine down on an actual flight with passengers? Yeah. What was that like? Uh, yeah, it wasn't bad. It was a, kind of a precautionary thing. Working out well. Just shut it down. Came in and landed pretty uneventful. So when something like that happens, do you make an announcement or anything like that, or you're like, oh, I'll have another uh, bag of peanuts? Yeah. And, you know, we'll yeah, we make announcements. Um, in all honesty, if you did, people in the back probably wouldn't even know what was going on. They probably wouldn't even notice. Yeah, man, this is how you do some sightseeing. This is great. 
It's what they call Clear Lake, which is kind of the recreational lake. Is it a lake? It looks like it's connected to the Gulf of Mexico. It is uh, connected to the bay, which connects to the Gulf, but they call it Clear Lake. Obviously, it's not clear, but that's what we got. Yeah, you know, it's, it's Gulf of Mexico clear. Yeah, there you go. How long have you flown this particular airplane? Uh, you know, we have two of them that we use for rides. And, uh, I don't know, uh, 10 years probably. It's hard to keep track of how much even have. You know, all of our flights are, you know, 20, 30 minutes. So you get a lot of, not much flight time, but a lot of landings. Yeah, I never thought about that, yeah. At what point do you uh, cut it off for rides when the weather starts turning on this? You know, we have some minimums. Uh, we need at least 1,500 feet. So, you know, we try to abide by that the best we can. A lot of times in these airplanes, we'd like to get, you know, 2,500 feet just to have a little safety margin there. Of course, we don't fly in the rain, obviously. Yeah, it would be hard to do an instrument approach in this, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. Yeah, so over here, uh, near the water, you see some amusement rides. It's an uh, area called Kima. It's a boardwalk. A lot of restaurants, little amusement areas. It's kind of nice. Is that the circle there on the uh, corner? Yeah, you can see the roller coaster and stuff. Yeah, if I did give a shout out to my, uh, I live down here to the left on this little island looking neighborhood. That's called Clear Lake Shores, and uh, that's where I live. Hey, there you go, hey! And somehow I got myself a lake to be canceled there. So if so, I didn't give a shout out or a circle around there, I wouldn't be good. That's right, for your constituency. You're a man of the people. Yeah, this is beautiful through here. How long have you lived in Texas? My whole life. I grew up in this area. I've pretty much been here the whole time. There you go, there you go. That's a really long runway on that thing. Good look. What are they, five, 6,000 feet each or something? Uh, I think, I think uh, 4,200 or something like that. That's pretty good for a uh, smaller DA yeah. water. Those three airplanes on the ramp next to the T-hangers there. There's a Viking, a Musketeer, and a Warrior, and they're like, they've been sitting there for years, and they're rough, too. Yeah, they kind of look like it from here. All right, squawk at 0455. Now we get down to 560, about 11 miles to the east with Romeo inbound for battle work. Crew check 568, Ellington Tower, squawk 5344. 5344, 568. Awesome. Thanks, man. Thank you. Appreciate that.